Welcome to today's Amyloidosis 101 patient webinar sponsored by the Amyloidosis Foundation. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Maury Gertz is the Roland Seidler Jr. Professor of the Art of Medicine and Chair of the Department of Internal Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He is a Master of the American College of Physicians. Dr. Gertz has authored over 450 publications and book chapters and an additional 500 abstracts, letters, and editorials, including the Amyloidosis chapter in Cecil's Textbook of Medicine. Dr. Gertz, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. What I hope to accomplish today is to give you an overview of how this disorder, amyloidosis, is affecting you, what are the relevant questions that you want to have for your health care provider, and leave ample opportunity for you to ask questions at the end of the lecture component of the talk. It's important to recognize that this is an educational event and not a venue to uh, obtain a second management opinion. Uh, with that in mind, I'll get started. I think to really understand the disease amyloidosis, you need to understand that everything in your body is biodegradable and recyclable. Most of the constituents of your body are used over and over and over. As an example, if we take your red blood cells, the oxygen-carrying cells of your body, the oldest of those blood cells is about four months old. After four months, the red cell goes to a recycling center in your body. The globin, the iron are all stripped for reuse. The membrane is stripped for reuse. And there's very, very little wastage as those components are reutilized to make new blood cells. Proteins in the body are very similar. The proteins in your body undergo a continuous recycling process where they're broken down and then used to be reassembled. And one way to think about it is that your body is assembled with half-inch nuts and half-inch screws, and you have a half-inch wrench when it comes time to dismantle it. When amyloid develops, however, the proteins that are built in your body are built with a three-quarter inch screw, a three-quarter inch nut, but you still only have the half-inch wrench. And as a consequence, you are no longer able to dismantle it. And because you can't dismantle it and recycle it because you don't have the right size wrench, it begins to build up in your body. And this protein that is non-biodegradable and non-recyclable that builds up in your body reaches a point where it will start to deposit in your organs. The symptoms that you develop depend on which organs are involved. The treatment is really based on what is the actual source of the non-biodegradable, non-recyclable amyloid protein. So I'd like to start by talking a little bit about the symptoms and the genesis of the symptoms of amyloidosis. For most patients with amyloidosis, the most common organ involved is the kidney. And to understand how the kidney produces symptoms, you need to understand how your kidney works. Your kidney fundamentally is acting like a sieve or a colander. If you think about the function of a sieve or a colander, let's say you're cooking peas or spaghetti, you boil it in water, then you dump it into the strainer or colander in your sink, and water then drains through down the drain and the peas and the spaghetti are kept in the colander. The kidney filters the same way, except the water that goes down the drain is your urine, and the stuff that your body wants to retain, the peas and the spaghetti, is actually the healthy, important protein of your blood. So daily, your blood is filtering through the colander, the sieve of your kidney. The water that spills through is your urine, and you retain the blood protein where it belongs in your bloodstream. Now, when amyloid deposits in the kidney, it actually punches holes in the kidney, in the colander or the sieve. 
And now, when you, with these large holes in the colander or sieve, when you cook spaghetti, when you boil the peas and you pour it through, the water still comes through perfectly normally. Unfortunately, the spaghetti and the peas pour through as well and are lost down your kitchen sink. The correlation with what happens in a real adult that gets amyloid deposits in the kidney is it punches these holes and the blood protein, which is floating in the plasma, spills right out through the holes and into the urine. And so frequently the most common recognition by a physician of a patient who presents with kidney amyloidosis is the finding of protein in the urine because it's spilling through the holes in the colander of your kidney. The second most common problem that occurs due to the spillage of protein through the kidney into the urine is it sends a signal to the liver to increase the production of cholesterol. And approximately half of the patients we see with kidney amyloid presented because they had massively elevated cholesterol levels in the blood, which was triggered by the protein spillage. Now, what are the consequences of having protein in the urine? Well, to understand that, you need to understand what the protein is doing in your bloodstream. The protein in your bloodstream is acting like a sponge, and that sponge holds water in the blood vessels. And anything that lowers the level of protein in the blood lowers the amount of sponge and causes the fluid to leak out of the blood vessels into the tissues, usually along the lines of gravity, so you'll get swollen or puffy feet, swollen or puffy legs. When we think about what causes low protein globally, the most common cause of low protein in the blood is starvation. So when you actually see on the news famine areas in India or Africa, you'll see children with all these very swollen bellies, despite the fact that they're clearly malnourished, this is a reflection of the reduction of blood protein because there's no protein in the diet and water starts leaking out. Individuals who have liver disease, the liver is where the protein gets assembled for your bloodstream, and if you have liver disease, you also will develop swelling because you can't assemble protein in your blood. In Kidney amyloid, the problem, again, is low protein, not because of nutrition, not because of assembly problems, but because you've got a broken sieve or colander and the protein that is in your blood spills out into your urine, and no matter how much you eat, you can't replace it, and that low protein causes swelling. Now, clearly, if the only problem with amyloid was a high cholesterol and swollen feet, we wouldn't make so much out of it. But the problem is that continuous protein leakage through the colander has an impact on the second component of the kidney, and that's the purifier of the kidney. The purifier of the kidney is what regulates the potassium, the sodium content gets rid of the nitrogen waste products and acid from your body. And the continuous spillage of protein into the urine eventually damages the purifier of the kidney so it can no longer regulate your body's equilibrium. As a consequence, poisonous nitrogen waste products will build up in the blood, which we refer to as uremia, and if it goes on long enough, that damage will render your kidney non-functional. And in fact, one-third of patients diagnosed with kidney amyloid who do not receive effective therapy or have a late diagnosis will end up on dialysis. And that's the major reason why we get aggressive with the management of kidney amyloid, not swelling, not high cholesterol, but to prevent the development of kidney failure. The second most common organ to be involved with amyloidosis is the heart. And to understand the problem with the heart, you need to understand how the heart works. The heart squeezes and relaxes, squeezes and relaxes. And in fact, if your heart beats 60 times a minute or once a second, it spends a third of a second squeezing, two-thirds of a second relaxing. 
the majority of individuals in the United States who have heart disease have it because they're diabetic, they smoked too much, they didn't exercise, and their coronary arteries plugged up with fatty material. When that happens, you don't get enough blood supply to your heart, the heart muscle dies, the heart can't squeeze as well, and that leads to very poor heart function. That is extremely common and has nothing whatsoever to do with how amyloid works, and that's why it's confusing, and that's why it's diagnosed late, and that's why it's difficult to recognize, because in amyloid, the problem isn't with the squeezing of the heart. The heart muscle is strong and can squeeze. The problem is that the amyloid, the non-biodegradable, non-recyclable protein, deposits in the heart, and by doing so makes the heart stiff, so the heart can't relax. And the heart, therefore, when it's resting in between beats for two-thirds of a second, can't fill with blood. And if it won't fill with blood, there's nothing to pump when the beat comes. One way of thinking about this is thinking about a child's water balloon on the water faucet. You can take a water balloon that's no bigger than the size of your forefinger, attach it to the faucet, and you can fill it with a quart of water relatively easily. Moreover, if you pull the balloon off the faucet, you'll have water shooting up to the ceiling as the elasticity of the balloon brings it back to its normal state and shoots the volume of water out. Now, if amyloid deposits in your heart, no longer is your heart elastic like a balloon. It gets to be like leather. And if you took a balloon made out of leather and attached it to the faucet, you'd barely be able to fill it up with two teaspoons of water. And when you pulled it off the sink, the faucet, it would dribble out. And there'd be very little volume to be able to generate. And that causes impaired function of the heart because it doesn't fill well, so there's nothing there to pump with the next beat. That will cause low blood pressure, it will cause, because your heart can't pump, the blood backs up and causes swelling in your feet and in your legs, oftentimes requiring a diuretic to manage it. But the most important problem is that when you try to exert yourself, when you try to walk, exercise, climb stairs, and you ask your heart to work a little bit harder, it isn't able to do so. Your heart is working at maximum capacity when it's evolved with amyloid at rest. So when you exert and try to ask your heart to do a little more, it simply can't. It won't provide blood, therefore, to the muscles, and therefore you will give out. You will not be able to walk. You'll be huffing and puffing. You won't be able to climb a flight of stairs. And that goes to the weakness and the shortness of breath that you get with amyloid and the swelling comes to back up of blood from the heart and can also be aggravated if you have kidney involvement due to the low protein in your blood. When amyloid involves the skin blood vessels, it causes them to be very fragile. And as a consequence, uh, you can get black and blue or bleeding typically around the face or around the eyelids as a clinical sign, 15% the amyloid deposits in the tongue cause your tongue to be enlarged. Dizziness on standing results because your blood pressure is low. And that can be a consequence usually of heart involvement so that when you stand and your body is supposed to adjust and improve blood flow to your brain, it can't because its ability to adjust blood flow is restricted due to the stiffening of the heart from balloon material to leather material. The third most common organ to be involved with amyloid is the nerve. Nerves are fundamentally electrical wires. The electrical wire has two parts. It has the wire itself and the insulation around the wire. In a nerve, the wire itself is called the axon. The insulation around the wire is the myelin sheath. And when amyloid develops, the myelin sheath begins to die back because of a lack of blood supply due to amyloid blocking blood to the insulation. And if you have a nerve, that has no insulation, just like a wire with no insulation, 
the wire will short out. If the wire or the nerve begins to short out or die, you begin to have numbness. And this usually goes by the length of the nerve or the length of the wire. So you start to get numbness in your feet first, and then the numbness climbs to the bottom of your calf, the middle of your calf, and to your knee. By the time the numbness climbs to your knee, the length of the wire is the same as the length of the wire in your upper extremities, and now your hands and fingers start to get numb and weak. Sometimes you'll get electrical shocks in your arms and legs as the nerve dies. It's shorting out the way that a wire would. And so those are the typical ways in which the kidney, the heart, and the nerve become involved with amyloid. And for most physicians, this is a very challenging diagnosis because amyloid only occurs in eight persons per million per year. And for most internists or family doctors, it's unlikely they'll see a single patient with amyloid in their entire career. Even for experienced kidney and heart doctors, they'll see one patient every four or five years, and often the diagnosis will be overlooked. It's very easy to understand this for patients who have heart amyloid. Because if a person comes in with weakness, fatigue, inability to climb stairs, and the physician suspects heart problems, they'll normally think about the most common heart problems, plugged coronary arteries. Some patients will have a coronary angiogram or catheterization completely normal. Or they'll think about valvular problems or valvular leaking. That's usually not found. When amyloid deposits in the walls of the heart, it actually causes the walls of the heart to thicken up. And if an echocardiogram is done, you actually see the thickening of the heart wall. Unfortunately, thickening of the heart wall is far more common due to high blood pressure. So it's very easy to look at the echo of a patient with amyloid and think they've had long-standing high blood pressure as the mechanism for causing the thickening. So all of the evidence without a high index of suspicion will be confusing and will tend to point the provider away from the correct diagnosis. When patients present with consistent clinical symptoms and the index of suspicion is high, this is a diagnosis that cannot be made with any blood test, any scan, or any urine. You have to have tissue biopsy proof. You actually do a biopsy, and you can actually see the non-biogradable, non-recyclable protein deposited in the tissues, whether that tissue is a heart biopsy or a kidney biopsy, but you can find it in skin biopsies or fat biopsies or biopsies of the gum. There are many places where the amyloid can be detected because it is usually widespread at diagnosis, even though only certain organs may be symptomatically involved. Amyloid is never found normally in an adult. It's always abnormal to find amyloid. Uh, And again, you can be suspicious based on specific tests such as echocardiogram or heart MRI, but you can only validate the diagnosis with a biopsy. Key critical questions that patients need to consider when they are diagnosed with amyloid is first, is my amyloid localized or is it systemic? Localized amyloid is a much more benign condition where the amyloid involves oftentimes the windpipe or the voice box or just the skin or just the bladder. These forms of amyloid are important to recognize because they're not life-threatening. Most of them are nuisance. Some of them do not require any form of treatment and are distinct from the life-threatening forms of systemic amyloid. Systemic amyloid is by far the more common of the two between localized and systemic. 
But systemic amyloid can be caused by two or three different causes, and each of them is reflected by the source of the amyloid. In the United States, the most common form of systemic amyloid is AL amyloid or light chain amyloid. The light chains are actually antibody proteins that the normal body develops in response to vaccination or immunization. So you have antibodies in your blood from getting a flu shot, getting measles vaccination, you cut yourself when you were nine years old, you scraped your knee, all of those will generate an antibody protein response. These antibody proteins are found in all adults and they're normal, but some patients make abnormal antibodies. And these antibodies become, as I mentioned, non-biogradable, non-biodegradable and non-recyclable, and they're therefore these light chain proteins, which are the structure of amyloid. Now, these light chain proteins in AL amyloid have only one source, and that's the bone marrow. And the source within the bone marrow are a cell population called plasma cells. Plasma cells are found in everybody's bone marrow. It's about 1%, if you will, of the acreage of that bone marrow, and it produces antibodies throughout your lifetime. Patients who develop AL amyloidosis oftentimes will develop an increase in the number of plasma cells, 5%, 7%, occasionally over 10%, and overproduce these non-biodegradable, non-recyclable antibodies that circulate in the bloodstream and then can deposit in virtually any organ of the body. We mentioned skin, nerve, kidney, and heart, but it can deposit in the lung, it can deposit in the saliva glands causing dry mouth, uh, it can uh, deposit in the wrist causing carpal tunnel syndrome, it can actually deposit in blood vessels causing aching or pain with walking or with chewing. Because these plasma cells are so harmful, that's why chemotherapy is typically used to manage that form of amyloid. The key here is to destroy, using chemotherapy, the plasma cells, the abnormal amyloid producing plasma cells in the bone marrow. And chemotherapy can be quite effective. For selected patients, we actually go one step further and escalate the dose of the chemotherapy to essentially destroy the entire bone marrow. We want to actually kill the bone marrow, and the bone marrow is the source of all of your blood production. The bone marrow produces all of the red blood cells that carry oxygen, all of the white cells that fight infection, and the cells that clot your blood. Of course, within the bone marrow, you always have that subpopulation of plasma cells that are making the abnormal amyloid antibody protein, the light chain protein that is being measured to assess the disease. The way in which you can actually kill or destroy the bone marrow without making it irreversible is to collect seeds, bone marrow seeds out of the bloodstream. These seeds are collected out of the bloodstream and then they are frozen. After they are frozen, very high doses of chemotherapy are administered in an effort to destroy the bone marrow in its entirety. And after the poisonous chemotherapy leaves the body, which takes a day or two, the seeds that were previously collected are taken out of the freezer and thawed and replanted, if you will, into the patient. And this process of taking the seeds, freezing them and thawing them, and we refer to these seeds as stem cells, taking these stem cells and then returning them to the patient is stem cell transplantation is a highly effective technique that allows the administration of very high doses of chemotherapy in an attempt to irreversibly destroy the amyloid-producing plasma cells of the bone marrow. 
This technique is a preferred technique, but is limited to patients who have minimal damage to their heart from the amyloid and minimal damage to the kidney from the amyloid because it's a very aggressive procedure that has a fair the toxic side effect profile and is limited to those patients who are relatively early diagnosed and generally speaking under the age of 70 years. But there are other forms of amyloid that occur. There is an inherited form of amyloid where you're actually born with the production of the non-biodegradable, non-recyclable protein, that inherited amyloid is actually detectable from birth, but usually doesn't cause symptoms for 40 to 50 years. That becomes the second key question for the physician, is what type of systemic amyloid do I have? Which is another way of asking, what is my amyloid made out of? Is it made out of light chains? which it would be in probably 80% of patients, or do I have an abnormal protein that's not light chain that I might have inherited from a mother or a father because it's a genetic inheritance where you only need to get the gene from one parent to get the disease. And, of course, not only is that relevant in planning therapy, but... It's relevant if you have this form of amyloid and you have brothers and sisters because they're at risk 50-50 of getting the gene. And if you have children or grandchildren, again, there's a 50-50 inheritance pattern to pass on this abnormal amyloid-producing gene down to the next generation. In terms of what the consequences are, depends on the stickiness of that specific amyloid protein. For inherited forms of amyloid, almost all of which are produced in the liver, the amyloid proteins will stick either to the nerve or to the heart, and kidney involvement is rare. Probably half of the patients have heart involvement, half will have nerve involvement, and a fraction will have both heart and kidney uh, sorry, heart and nerve involvement. As a consequence, patients can present with burning or numbness in their feet or alternatively shortness of breath, fatigue, and weight loss. And it is imperative when a diagnosis of amyloid is made that it be clear what is the actual source of the amyloid, what is the type of amyloid in order to effectively plan therapy because With these inherited forms of amyloid, they're never produced in the bone marrow, and as a consequence, chemotherapy is the wrong treatment. Historically, for most patients with inherited amyloid, because the source of the abnormal amyloid protein is the liver, liver transplantation has been widely used. But there are now a number of experimental treatments that are available and are enrolling patients globally that are designed to suppress the body's production of the amyloid protein by working directly on the liver and preventing the liver from making the amyloid substance itself. And this is being looked at as a mechanism for suppressing the production of amyloid in that type. There are other new treatments that actually have become available in the last few years. For patients who have the inherited form of amyloid, approved in Europe and approved in Japan, there's a medicine called tefamidus, and tefamidus actually interferes with the folding of the amyloid protein made in the liver. So it's made, but it doesn't become biodegradable and non-recyclable and doesn't deposit in the tissues. And that's been approved outside the United States and is under trial in the United States. A second agent that works in a similar fashion to interfere with the misfolding is a medication called diflunosol. Diflunosol is a medication that is commercially available that can be used for familial amyloid, not for light chain or primary amyloid, to suppress the production of the amyloid protein in the liver. 
Recently, new treatments including antibodies, monoclonal antibody treatments to try and dissolve amyloid deposits. For many years, the only available treatment for light chain amyloid, the amyloid produced in the bone marrow, has been chemotherapy to prevent production of the light chains from the bone marrow plasma cells. But now there are antibody trials underway that actually are designed to bind and dissolve the amyloid. And so this is a new non-chemotherapy, highly innovative exploratory clinical trial to try and manage it. There's a third type of amyloid that's neither inherited nor bone marrow derived, and that's called wild type TTR amyloidosis. That's quite a mouthful, but the old term for that was senile systemic amyloid or senile cardiac amyloid. This is typically heart involvement with amyloid that occurs usually after the age of 65 and causes slowly progressive decline in the efficiency of heart function, leading to shortness of breath, fatigue, weight loss. Historically, there was no treatment for that form of amyloid, but now there also are trials, particularly to famitis, looking at the management of this type of amyloid. So essentially, most types of amyloid now have available therapy for them, which has really increased the optimism of the medical community in the management of this disorder. There are new types of chemotherapy available for the treatment of light chain amyloid. In December, uh, the FDA gave... uh, preferred status for the development of the oral drug called ixazomib, and ixazomib is now in phase three trials uh, for the treatment of patients with light chain amyloidosis. That's a very important trial. And for non-light chain amyloidosis, new antibodies are being developed and new treatments to suppress the production in the liver as well as to enhance the ability to dissolve it are all underway. I'd like to spend a few minutes to summarize some of the key points when you see your physician. The first is understanding how your amyloid was diagnosed. If it's the kidney, it's your usually urinary protein, high cholesterol, or actual damage to the purifying function of the kidney. If it's heart amyloid, it's usually because your heart has become stiff, relaxes poorly, fills poorly with blood during the resting phase, and that results in an inability to pump and is easy to confuse because it doesn't have the classic signs of heart malfunction due to the common causes due to blockage or plugging of the coronary arteries. Irregular heart rhythm is a common finding as the amyloid deposits in the electrical system of the heart, and a significant fraction of patients with heart amyloid ultimately uh, end up with a pacemaker or a defibrillator in order to sustain a healthy rhythm. The actual mechanism of weight loss in amyloid is not well understood. Uh, In heart amyloid, it's often related to the fact that heart work is so high that it burns lots and lots of calories even at rest and it leads to weight loss. But you get weight loss with nerve amyloid and with kidney amyloid and liver amyloid, and the mechanism is not understood, but weight loss of 20 to 50 pounds is not unusual with amyloidosis itself. In terms of the non-chemotherapy treatments that are available for amyloid or the non-experimental new drugs available for amyloid, there are supportive measures that can be used in the medical community. For patients who have heart failure, Salt restriction reduces the tendency to retain water, as well as diuretics help with the fluid retention that often is seen. 
because patients are losing weight, high calorie intake can be very important because it helps reduce the tendency to lose weight. Doing everything you can to sustain a regular healthy activity level, even if it's only walking at a slow pace, is good for muscle blood flow and muscle tone. Unlike coronary artery disease, where if someone overexerts, like shoveling snow, they can actually have a sudden heart event, maybe death, due to overexertion. This is not the case with amyloid because the blood supply to the heart is fine, but the muscle is weak. So if you overexert, if you try to do too much, you just get tired. And so there's no harm in trying to ensure that you maintain and sustain daily activity level. In terms of the monitoring of the amyloid, that becomes a critical issue. For most patients who have light chain amyloid, the amyloid produced in the bone marrow, the light chains come in two flavors, kappa and lambda. And what you will find is that your physician is actually measuring the light chain level, whether it's kappa or lambda, on a serial basis as you get treatment in order to assess whether you're deriving benefits. So typically, because the light chains are made by the amyloid-producing cells, the higher they are, the worse they are. And if you get effective therapy, that will lower the level of the light chain successively, and that the lower the light chain, there's no question, the better the prognosis and the longer the survival. So the focus in light chain amyloid is lower the light chain, the kappa or lambda light chain. Again, before you embark on treatment for your amyloid, you need to be absolutely certain about the type you're dealing with. Frequently, that requires that the biopsy that demonstrated amyloid be sent out for evaluation to ensure that the specific type of amyloid has been identified without question that allows for effective therapy. In terms of what determines the prognosis of amyloid, the staging system is relatively simple. Amyloid is divided into four different stages, one, two, three, four, and it's only based on three blood tests. And that determines the prognosis. Two of the blood tests are a measure of the efficiency of the heart. The two blood tests are NT Pro BNP, and the other is troponin T. Those are two heart blood tests that are important for prognosis. Finally, the third is the free light chain test, that light chain kappa lambda measurement, because that is important. The higher, the worse the prognosis, frankly, but it's a useful measure at the time of diagnosis to understand what the average outlook is and what the average prognosis, recognizing that it won't tell you exactly how you're going to do, but will give you some general sense of average. When a patient is diagnosed with amyloidosis, what is typically done is screening is performed to allow your provider to understand what's the full extent. So if you find amyloid in the kidney, that's important, but it's just as important to understand whether that amyloid has deposited not only in the kidney, but is it deposited in the heart? So you need heart blood tests. Is it deposited in the nerve? That often requires testing. Is it deposited in the liver, the lung, the bowel, etc.? Does it deposit in the nerves that regulate your blood pressure or your bowel function? All of those require screening in a newly diagnosed patient to understand the full extent of what we're up against. Again, in then summarizing that the available therapies are directly connected to the type of amyloid. For AL amyloid, the most common type, it's chemotherapy, which can be given either in traditional doses or in very high doses with seed reimplantation, stem cell transplant. 
or the new experimental antibody treatments. For inherited amyloid, solid organ transplantation, heart, liver, and kidney have all been done, but now there's new treatments that are available that prevent the amyloid from becoming non-biodegradable and depositing into the tissues, as well as preventing the production of the amyloid protein by interfering substances that suppress its production. I didn't mention much about AA amyloid because it's an incredibly rare form of amyloid in the Western world, but if there are patients who are currently online who have AA amyloid, I would be happy to answer their questions. And I think with that, I will stop and take your questions. Thank you for your attention. And we will use our remaining time to address your questions. To submit a written question or comment, just click on the private chat tab on the lower left-hand side of your screen, type your question in the text box at the very bottom of that space, and then click send or hit enter to submit your question. And at this point, to Dr. Gertz, I'll turn it back to you to address a few of those questions that were submitted earlier. Thank you very much. Uh, some really good questions, and I'll start going through them for as much time as we have. This one says, my husband underwent a stem cell transplant in November of 2011. We have read that drugs like melphalan increase a patient's risk of developing leukemia a few years after treatment. Could you discuss how significant the increase of risk is and uh, if routine monitoring will allow early detection what treatment options exist? That is an extremely important uh, question because there's no question that melphalan has the potential to damage the bone marrow. Our experience is that the majority of patients who've developed um, leukemia-like illnesses after melphalan exposure have received melphalan in pill form. There's something about taking melphalan orally uh, over extended periods of time that damage the seed cells of the bone marrow, making them unable to mature and ultimately resulting in the development of leukemia. People who have a stem cell transplant, however, really only have received two days of melphalan. We have 638 patients now that we've transplanted in our program, and without prior exposure to melphalan, we've actually only seen two patients that have actually developed leukemia or leukemia-related illness. And so we estimate the risk to be less than one-half of 1%. Even so, it is serious when it occurs, and as a consequence, we do monitor patients. The reason for that is that we can actually find that in blood testing. Uh, patients who do develop this type of leukemia are at significant risk. In the patients that we've seen it develop, in one patient it developed eight years after the transplant, and in the second patient it developed nine years after the transplant. That patient, however, is still alive receiving supportive therapy, and that supportive therapy is um, transfusion, and then there are medications such as Videza that can uh, be very helpful. I think that was a very important um, question. Here's one. My mother was diagnosed with amyloidosis after death. Her liver was the affected organ. Does this indicate that I might be at risk for familial or another type? And the answer is no. 15% uh, of AL amyloidosis patients have liver involvement, and that still makes it far more common than familial. I don't think that testing the blood with protein electrophoresis is the correct approach. I think you simply have to have the doctor who was responsible for mom's death, who was responsible for her care at the time she died, excuse me, tell you what type of amyloid it was. That either can be determined from electrophoresis that was done or by mass spec analysis of any tissues that mom might have that has amyloid in it, and then because if you have a serum protein electrophoresis and it's negative, I don't think that proves anything at all. It certainly doesn't prove that you weren't at risk of AL. It doesn't prove that you don't have AF. You really need to have mom's T 
tissues testing. Here's one. My sister was just diagnosed, and it sounds like it is the type of amyloid. She's only 25. Someone who is 25 years old would be very, very unlikely to have AL amyloid. I mean, that would really be way, way extreme. And I'd say in my 30 years' experience seeing over 3,000 patients with AL, I think I've only seen one or two that young. So the first thing I would think of is this is not AL, and then the testing of the amyloid tissues to determine what the subunit protein is really becomes critical. You need to find out whether it's TTR. Let's see. Um, this is a very important question. My family has ALA60. That means that this is a family that has inherited amyloid of the TTR type. Recently, some of my cousins, and I will assume that these are cousins who are tested and shown to carry the gene, have started taking diflunosol. They presently have no symptoms but feel this may be a deterrent or hold back the disease. Quite frankly, I don't think that's unreasonable at all. Here you have individuals who have known family members who developed amyloid and became ill due to it. We know that diflunosol in patients with established amyloid has the potential to slow down the progression of the disease. These patients are not eligible for any of the active studies because the studies that we're currently doing, looking at all the new treatments for inherited amyloid, require symptoms. And they don't have symptoms. They're just worried that they'll develop symptoms. So they're taking diflunosol in the hope that it might delay the onset of symptoms, and I actually would have a lot of difficulty criticizing that. That seems to be a logical approach. I don't know whether it will be beneficial, but diflunosol is usually pretty well tolerated, and as a consequence, I think it is a very reasonable approach. I have one question asking about excluding chemotherapy, what non-traditional practices are being studied. A professor in Germany um, has tried ECGC, which is the chemical extract from green tea, and has been using green tea in the treatment of his amyloidosis, and actually an article has been published on this. And in this one instance, uh, benefit was apparently seen. <clears throat> this hasn't been widely accepted by the medical community, and green tea can interfere with some active regimens for amyloid. It interferes with the effect of Velcate, for example. However, it has been used, it has been published, and although I don't think it's undergoing investigations outside of Germany, it has been used uh, for patients with amyloidosis. Here's one. What are the recommendations for dealing with neuropathy caused by AL amyloid? So that becomes a very important question because really only 10% of amyloid patients AL have symptomatic neuropathy. And so many patients with AL amyloidosis are being treated with Velcade, which does cause significant neuropathy it becomes important to distinguish is the neuropathy from the amyloid or is the neuropathy from the treatment of the amyloidosis. That becomes very, very important because obviously if it's due to the treatment, treatment needs to be modified or the neuropathy will get worse. The neuropathy of AL amyloid can be quite troublesome, but there are management strategies available. Uh, topical lidocaine has been used in the form of patches. We've compounded a salve that includes lidocaine and it includes um, analgesics that we have had patients rub on their skin successfully. Uh, that is refillable. That's, nothing works in every patient. And so there is some trial and error, but they will use this topical. It, it, the primary component of the cream is ketamine, and we've compounded that successfully. Many patients do need to take um, medicines such as gabapentin. 
uh, which is trade name Neurotin, and Pregbalin, trade name Lyrica, to help control it. Many patients' neuro neuropathy symptoms are worse at night, and as a consequence, they have to take sleeping medications in order to fall asleep. And some patients do require opioids in order to control the neuropathy pain to uh, fall asleep. I have one question about antibody therapy uh, in um, amyloid. And as I mentioned earlier in the talk, uh, we are actively, we've enrolled uh, approximately 27 patients in a monoclonal antibody trial to dissolve the amyloid deposits. We'll be presenting those results in Chicago in May, and we anticipate that we'll be doing further studies. So there are antibodies available for patients with amyloidosis to participate in. Here's a question on the relationship between amyloidosis and coexisting cancers such as Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia and multiple myeloma. Uh, a very important question because there are some patients who don't have plasma cells in the bone marrow making amyloid. They have other blood cells in the bone marrow called lymphoplasmacytic cells or lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma or lymphoma. Some people have mantle cell lymphoma. Some people have marginal cell, cell lymphoma. But they have a lymphoma that fulfills criteria for Waldenstrom's, and these cells make amyloid protein that the body can't be broken down. And so there's a very intimate relationship because the cells of the Waldenstrom's, and in patients with myeloma, the cells of myeloma are the same cells that make the amyloid. <clears throat> So the treatment of the associated conditions are almost identical. So if you treat the Waldenstrom's or if you treat the myeloma, you actually are treating the amyloid because you're reducing the production of the amyloid substance itself. Okay. Um, This is a question on the use of Revlimid in the treatment of amyloid. Years ago, when we first reported the use of Revlimid for the treatment of amyloid, we had a lot of difficulty. Patients tolerated it poorly. There were a lot of side effects with it. People couldn't stay on treatment very long, and there was a high side effect profile. <clears throat> So at the time, we were not overly enthusiastic with Revlimid, but I think over the last few years, we've gotten smarter in understanding the best ways to administer the agent. So we use Revlimid, which is approved for myeloma treatment, in lower doses, and we're much quicker to identify side effects that may cause increased shortness of breath or breathing problems and make pauses into the program or reductions into the program. And I'd have to say that although we were not as enthusiastic, we're certainly using it now and today in patients um, who did not benefit from Velcade-based treatment. Here's a very, very uh, insightful question about amyloid involvement and whether it uh, impacts the flexibility of the intestinal tract. Usually, intestinal tract involvement with amyloid is a combination of diarrhea alternating with constipation, and it actually, in most instances, is related to nerve regulation of intestinal function and that the GI tract involvement is actually a problem with how the bowel propels food down the intestinal tract. If it propels too slowly, profound constipation can occur. If it propels too quickly, then you can get diarrhea. And unfortunately, in many patients, those two can alternate in 
the same patient so that they can have five, six days, no bowel movements, and then can have liquid diarrhea for 48 hours. It's a very difficult problem to deal with. Medications are often not effective, and generally speaking, the type of problem usually requires consultation and evaluation at a specialty center that has a lot of uh, integrated care. Um, Here's an important question. We're running short, but we've got time for two more. I have a question. My bone marrow biopsy was negative for amyloid. If the plasma cells in bone marrow produce amyloid, why wasn't it found in the biopsy? That's a very logical question. And, in fact, in patients with AL, only half actually have amyloid in the bone marrow. Just because the synthesis occurs in the bone marrow, the processing where it becomes non-biodegradable actually occurs outside the bone marrow, and it's not well understood why in some patients the light chains are sticky to the heart, in others sticky to the kidneys or both, and in some sticky to the gastrointestinal tract. So it's logical if it's produced in the bone marrow, why don't I see it there? But in reality, only half of the patients will actually have amyloid in the bone marrow, so that's not inconsistent or illogical. One uh, writer asks, how do you pronounce H-E-M-A-T-O-P-O-I-E-T-I-C? That is hematopoietic. I decided to do that because it's an easy question. Um, Let's see. Can you explain what types of treatments a person with non-AL, non-TTR amyloids, such as ALEC2 and APOA1, would hope for? And that will probably be the last question. It's unlikely that trials will be developed because in most years that is seen in less than 20 or 30 patients, and so the likelihood of getting development is small. But in both of those disorders, organ transplantation has been used quite successfully. Both ALEC2 and APOA1 tend to involve the kidney. They're extremely slowly in terms of their progression, and so uh, their organ failure doesn't occur for many, many years. But when organ failure does occur, these patients are candidates for kidney transplantation. And so I think that that is, we're very optimistic about that because of the success of organ transplantation. Then where can one sign up for the antibody clinical trials for systemic AL? You go to clinicaltrials.gov and type in NEOD or AL amyloidosis. It will give you the trial and a list of centers in the United States where this antibody is available for enrollment. I wanted to thank all of you for uh, signing into the webinar. Um, Fortunately, our time is short. Uh, Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon. That concludes today's presentation, Amyloidosis 101 Patient Webinar, sponsored by the Amyloidosis Foundation and presented by Dr. Maury Gertz. A reminder, at the conclusion of today's program, you'll have access to an online program evaluation. Please take a moment to fill it out. Your feedback will help us to continue to bring you future quality programming. Today's program is copyrighted in 2015, Amyloidosis Foundation. All rights reserved.